Like let's, let's start talking about some of the pathogens or diseases of the skin. We've already spent some time talking about the defensive characteristics of the skin and normal microbiota. Now let's dive in feet first and talk about some of the pathogens that can affect our skin. We're first going to focus on the maculopopular diseases. These are diseases that cause skin eruptions. Oh, whoa, what was that there? Let's try that again. Reset the smart board. There we go. These, this, these are diseases that result in skin eruptions. Sometimes they will be flat, or sometimes they'll be very slightly raised. Our first disease we're going to focus on is measles. Measles is a disease that's highlighted in your textbook. Another name for measles is rubella. Approximately 385 children die from measles every day. This is despite the fact that we have a very effective vaccine against measles, and this vaccine has been available for over 50 years. Before the measles vaccine was introduced, approximately 6 million people died from measles every year. And let's see here. If we were to do some back of the napkin math, that would be over 1,000 people every day died from measles every year. I would need a calculator to give you a more accurate answer there. Since the year 2002, deaths from measles have dropped off approximately 74%. This has primarily been attributed to, to developing countries that have had an increase in vaccination rates. This is contrasted with developed countries that have actually had a decrease in vaccination rates for measles. This is bound, based primarily on an unfounded link that the vaccine for measles causes autism. It does not. We spent a fair amount of time in our immune system section talking about that, so I will not get on a high horse right now. If we look at measles, it has some fairly generic symptoms. Sore throat, dry cough, headache, conjunctivitis, AKA, pink eye. We'll also have lymphedema or lymphodentitis fever, or there can be some red maculopopular exanthem or lesions that will erupt. Generally speaking, these will start in the mouth, around the lips and the tongue, progress across the face, and then spread down the trunk and the appendages or, or extremities of the body. Here is the classic rash associated with measles. Notice how the skin is covered in a wide variety or very uniform mat of red bumps that are quite scratchy. The sequelae or complica and complications that can be associated with measles are laryngitis, bronchial pneumonia, secondary bacterial infections, pneumonia, and encephalitis. And in case you aren't familiar with this term, sequelae, sequelae or is a term that defines a secondary complication that happens as a result of a disease. A very common sequelae of a joint replacement, let's say a patient's getting a knee replaced, a common sequelae that they need to worry about is a blood clot forming in the lower leg. Getting the knee replaced doesn't directly cause the blood clot, but it's going to be associated, as a common complication associated with getting a knee replaced. Some other complications or sequelae that are associated with measles include subacute sclerosing panencephalitis. This is kind of a big word right here. So when we see this term pan, that means the whole thing, the world. And when we think of enceph, think of the brain. When we think of itis, think of inflammation. So when we see subacute sclerosing panencephalitis, this is a mild inflammation of the entire brain. It's a very progressive condition that results in deterioration of the brain. As the brain is deteriorating, there'll be breakdown of the white matter and the gray matter of the brainstem. It occurs approximately one in every million infections of measles, so it's not terribly common. Thankfully, measles in the United States is not super duper common, so when we look at a one in one million infect chance of having this subacute sclerosing panencephalitis, Thankfully, not many cases have been occurring in the United States. It's caused by a defective version of the measles, measles virus. The measles virus, generally speaking, doesn't cause this symptom, but if it mutates so it's not working properly, it can result in this panencephalitis. 
obviously, if the brain is swelling everywhere, and this constant or this prolonged swelling of the brain is going to cause neurological impairment and intellectual impairment. If not treated appropriately, it will eventually lead to coma and death. So it's a big deal. Measles is caused by, well, the measles virus. It's a member of the genus Morbillo, virus, and it's a single-stranded, enveloped RNA virus. This fam the measles virus is in the family Paramyxovirus. That's not necessarily important. I promise I'm not going to ask you any family taxonomic information on the exams. We'll focus on genuses and species names when available. One thing that I'm particularly excited about or interested about that you should be as well as measles is an enveloped RNA virus. What does enveloped mean? It means that we have that protein coating, the capsid, around the nucleotides. And then around that, we also have some lipids. So if we looked at a measles virus, it would have lipids on the outside, and then it would have proteins, and then it would have the genetic information in the center. Over the course of the infection, we'll find that the virus is going to implant itself in a respiratory mucosa. As it implants itself in our respiratory mucosa, it will infect both cells of the bronchia and the trachea. From our respiratory tract, the virus is then capable of traveling through the lymphatic system, where it's going to continue to multiply and eventually get dumped into the bloodstream. Viremia is going to then carry the virus to the skin and other organs of the body. This virus, the measles virus, results in a condition known as syncytia. Syncytia is a condition that occurs when two separate human cells with two separate nuclei become fused together to form a larger cell that has two nuclei. So if you were to see a tri or quad or tetranucleide cell in a patient's histological sample, that's a big clue that something's not working correctly there. We as human beings should not have cells that have three or four or five nuclei present in them. This fusion of cells is, occurs when the virus is binding to the cell membranes of two adjacent cells and then causes those cell membranes to merge together. Measles is an incredibly infectious disease. It's transmitted by respiratory droplets. So if somebody sneezes, the measles virus can enter the air and float around a room and infect everyone within that room. On the plus side, humans are the only known reservoir of the measles virus. So in theory, if we were to eliminate measles and give everyone in the world the vaccine for the measles virus, it would be eliminated within a generation because there won't be any animal reservoirs harboring the measles virus. If a person is infected with the measles virus, they generally speak are going to be infectious for the period of incubation, the prodromal phase, and the skin rash phase. So they're going to be infected before, or infectious before they develop symbol, symptoms, while well, they're starting to develop symbol, symptoms, and while well, they have full-fledged symptoms. But once they start to get better, when they are at the convalescing phase, where they start to heal, then they are no longer infectious. Measles says it can only survive in areas where we have large, dense populations of susceptible individuals. Because measles can only be carried and transmitted via human beings, we need a continuous supply of human beings to keep the measles infection going, to keep that measles virus alive. When diagnosing so a patient that has the, infection, the measles infection, the physician and healthcare provider is going to look for the clinical presentation. And they're going to look for the signs and symptoms that we talked about earlier. And while each of those signs and symptoms are fairly generic by themselves, when taken together, they can be indicative of a measles infection. To confirm the presence of a measles infection, we are going to perform an ELISA test using immunoglobulin M as the measles antigen. To prevent measles, we are going to focus on vaccinations. The measles mump rubella vaccine is going to contain a live, attenuated measles virus. And I need to emphasize that it contains the attenuated measles virus. And this vaccine is going to confer protection for approximately two decades, 20 years. Healthy children ages 12 months to 15 months are encouraged to receive their first dose 
of this vaccine, the booster shot for the toddler right before they enter primary school. If a patient comes down with measles, the treatment options include reducing the fever with prophylactics, suppressing their cough, replacing less fluid, and some remedies that vary from patient to patient to relieve the neurological and respiratory systems. Patients are also going to need to keep an IV to help maintain nutrient, electrolyte, and fluid levels. And a vitamin A supplement can also be recommended to help treat this condition. Rubella is closely linked to measles. Rubella is sometimes known as German measles. In Latin, the name for rubella means little red. This rubella, rubella results in a relatively minor rash that forms on the patient that has very few complications. If the patient becomes infected with rubella while they are in utero, there can be serious damage and birth defects that can occur, both physical and neurological. If a woman is in their childbearing years, it's important that she is up to date on her rubella vaccine so that she doesn't accidentally harbor the virus and then cause her child, while the child is in utero, to become infected with rubella. If we look at postnatal rubella, so uh, we're looking at a patient that has rubella and this patient has recently been born, so a newborn infant with rubella, there's going to be pink macules and papules forming a rash on their skin. It's going to appear first on the face, just like measles does, and it'll progress down the trunk and then toward the extremities of the body. Rubella, though, unlike measles, is going to be much resolved and advanced much quicker. It has approximately a three-day turnaround, and it's much milder than full-blown measles. If we look at an adult with rubella, an adult that has rubella is going to have joint inflammation and pain rather than the rash. Sometimes it's possible that the rubella, adult rubella can be confused as I'm getting old and having stiff joints, and occasionally it's misconstrued as Lyme's disease. If someone has prenatal rubella, so we're talking about a patient that is in utero, a patient that has not yet been born yet, that rubella can be tetragenic. In other words, it's going to cause serious birth defects to the fetus. A tetragen or pterogen is a chemical or condition that causes serious birth defects. This virus can go from mom to baby in utero, even if mom isn't experiencing any of the symptoms, if mom is asymptomatic. The infection during the first trimester can oftentimes result in miscarriage. If the infection happens later on in the second trimester, there is a dramatically reduced chance of miscarriage, but there still is a significant chance of birth defects. If the infection occurs in the third trimester, the risk to baby has been correspondingly decreased. One of the most common birth defects associated with rubella, or a prenatal rubella infection, includes deafness. Occasionally, there will be some cardiac abnormalities, ocular lesions, or mental and physical retardation. Other complications or sequelae include anemia, hepatitis, pneumonia, carditis, and bone infections. So please, if you are a young lady thinking of getting a child or thinking of conceiving, please make sure you're up to date on your MMR vaccine. Rubella is caused by the ruby, ruby virus. This is a virus that's from the family Togaviridae. It's a non-segmented, single-stranded RNA virus with a loose lipid envelope. And thankfully, there's only one serotype, only one strain of this virus. Humans are the only known host of the rubella vi ruby virus, just like humans are the only known host of the measles virus. Our, this virus, this ruby virus, has the ability to stop mitosis. So the younger a patient is when they are infected with this virus, the more pronounced the damage it will be to that patient. If a, ch a patient's in that first trimester, so we have a prenatal infection with this virus, and this virus begins to disrupt mitosis or cellular division, early on in the developmental period, there will be very profound birth defects. This virus, Ruby virus, is also capable of inducing apoptosis of normal healthy cells, and depending on the degree of apoptosis, can irreversibly cause harm to the tissues of major organ systems. It's also capable of damaging our vascular endothelium. 
The endothelium is the inner lining of the vascular system. So it's going to be that very smooth, slippery tissue that's in the inside of all of our blood vessels and our hearts. And as that endothelium is damaged, it hinders blood flow to the body and will cause many organs to suffer from a lack of blood supply and have poor development. Generally speaking, rubella is endemic worldwide in that it's present in all major population centers throughout the world. It's typically going to be initiated when a patient comes in contact with a respiratory secretion from an infected individual. Occasionally, urine is the vector that can transmit rubella. This virus is shed throughout the prodormal phase in up to one week after the rash appears. If we're looking at an infant that's been infected congenitally, so the infant got their disease from mom, this infant that has a congenital infection is going to be contagious for a much longer period of time compared to an adult who's been infected. Our, this measles, rubella's virus is only mildly communicable. Unlike the measles virus, which is highly communicable or highly contagious, this measles vi or excuse me, this rubella virus doesn't transmit as easily. We need close living conditions, close proximity in order for this virus to spread. Rubella is very well controlled within the United States. In each of the last several years, there's been fewer than 10 confirmed cases of rubella in the United States, and hopefully we can keep that number nice and low. <coughs> to diagnose rubella, typically, we're going to have a tough time. Rubella mimics other diseases. It's very difficult to diagnose rubella on clinical grounds alone. The signs and symptoms of rubella can be easily misinterpreted for a wide variety of other diseases. To confirm a rubella, a rubella diagnosis, we're going to need to use an IgM, immunoglobulin M antibody ELISA test, just like with measles, or we could also look for latex agglutination. To prevent rubella and treat rubella infections, we're going to focus on vaccinations. We have an attenuated rubella vaccine that's part of the MMR, measles, mump, rubella vaccination, that should be administered at 12 to 15 months and given a, as a boost between four to six years, so generally speaking, right before the child enters primary school. Postnatal rubella, so rubella that a child gets from mom very shortly after being born, is typically going to be benign and require only some symptomatic treatments. There is no specific treatment available, though, for congenital rubella. Another skin disease that's grouped together with measles, mumps, and rubella is known as the fifth disease. Traditionally, this was known as the fifth disease because this is one of the classic rash-based diseases that children would receive during childhood. And this was just the fifth one. Um, the fifth disease is also known as urethemia infectosum. It's recognized by doctors as a rash in a child. Many times, it can be mistaken for scarlet fever, measles, rubella, or another rash. The signs and symptoms of the fifth disease include a slapped cheek appearance. And if you look at photographs of individuals that have this disease, it looks like they are blushing, so to speak. They have red cheeks. Within two days, this rash will spread from the cheek and then spread to the body. However, it's going to be most prominent on the arms, legs, and trunk of the body. This rash will last for up to several weeks and can be brought on by any activity that increases body heat. So as we're increasing that blood flow to the surface of the skin, we're going to have an increase in redness to emphasize or further pronounce the rash caused by the fifth disease. Our fifth disease is caused by parovirus B19. It's not a very exciting name. Our diagnosis of the fifth disease is going to be done primarily via clinical presentation, so we'll look for the signs and symptoms, and we'll need to rule out rubella via testing with IgM antibodies and ELISA screening. When in doubt, most physicians are probably going to err on the side of rubella as opposed to the fifth disease. Our fifth disease is very contagious. There is no vaccine and no treatment for the fifth disease, and it's usually a fairly mild disease. One of the reasons why most people never hear about the fifth disease is because very often individuals don't even realize they have it. Most parents 
aren't going to take their child to the doctor because the child has slightly pink cheeks. And in extreme situations, with that rash developing on the arms and appendages, a few parents would be potentially likely to take their children to the doctor, but it's such a mild rash that it, many times the child doesn't even complain about it. We also have rosola. Rosola is a common disease in young children, it's one of these five rash-like diseases that occurs. Um, sometimes it's also been referred to as the sixth disease. The signs and symptoms of rosola can result in a maculopopular rash. This can happen in approximately 70% of cases, or excuse me, this can happen, but approximately 70% of the cases do not have that occurring. Usually, rosola is going to be accompanied by a high fever, 41 degrees Celsius to 105 degrees, fair, or 105 degrees Fahrenheit, so typically very high. And for, since most people are moving over to the metric system, recall that we have 37 degrees Celsius for regular body temp. So this, regular, this high fever can last for up to three days and will need immediate treatment. A fever that high is definitely going to merit going into the emergency room. Seizures can occur during this period, and on the fourth day, the fever disappears and the rash will appear. So if we have a period of four days of high fever, and then the fever is gone and is replaced by a rash, that's a good clue that maybe the patient has rosola as the disease. And it's caused by human herpes virus 6, HHV6, and occasionally human herpes virus 7. This human herpes virus can remain latent within the host indefinitely after the infection has cleared. So after a patient has received, been infected by this virus, the patient is going to be infected with the virus for the rest of their lifetime. This virus can occasionally leave latency and reactivate in childhood or adulthood and result in symptoms that are very similar to mononucleolus or mono. To transmit rosola, we're typically going to find that most individuals in the United States are infected with it by adulthood with almost a 100% infection rate. It's probably going to be transmitted via direct contact because it's a human herpes virus and most herpes viruses are transmitted via direct contact. One thing though that's worth not emphasizing is that this disease can be linked to autoimmune disorders or stressful situations in our lives. Since most adults in the United States, approximately 100%, are infected with this virus, and most adults are not exhibiting signs or symptoms of the infection, it's thought that our immune system has natural, that we as hu humans have natural immunity to this virus. To prevent this infection, we don't have any tricks or methods. With nearly 100% infection rate in healthy adults, um, there's not a lot of motivation right now to develop a treatment or a vaccine for rosola. Here's a summary figure talking about the diseases which we have been mentioning. We've had measles, rubella, fifth disease, and rosola, aka the sixth disease. There are a few other conditions that are worth mentioning. There are scarlet fever, secondary syphilis, Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Those are diseases which are mentioned in other parts of your textbook. Measles has that body-wide um, speckled rash. Rubella is characterized by a inflammation of the cheeks, just like the fifth disease is also characterized by an inflammation of the cheeks. And then rosola is characterized by a rash that spreads across the trunk after three to four days of a high fever. So, concept class, which of these childhood diseases are not frequently vaccinated against? Is it measles, rubella, the fifth disease, or rosola? You can rewind the video, or you can flip back in your textbook, or your PowerPoint slides to get me an answer. Go ahead and pause the video and find me an answer. One, two, three, four, five. All right, class. We are going to vaccinate for measles and rubella as part of the MMR vaccination routine. We do not routinely vaccinate for the fifth disease or rosola, so the correct answer is E, both C and D. 
If you have any questions for me about these skin diseases, please feel free to post them on the discussion board or shoot me an email. Happy studies.